Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Dialysis Access, Maturation, and the Role of Flow Volumes. My name is Kelly Baer, and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the Questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will be monitoring questions throughout the presentation, and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left side of your screen is the Resources tab. Click on this tab for links to today's handouts, which include a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please, review the, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you may click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the SVU CME credit, you must be registered logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will open automatically at the conclusion of the live session and be available from the IAC Pro Libraries website for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. And now I would like to introduce today's guest speaker, Kelly Burns. Ms. Burns is Coordinator of Quality and Accreditation for North Norton Healthcare in Louisville, Kentucky, where she also serves as Technical Manager for the four hospital-based non-invasive vascular labs. She is board certified by ARDMS as an RVT. Ms. Burns is a board member of the Society for Vascular Ultrasound, serving on the Executive Committee as Treasurer, her clinical interests surround the study of dialysis access, the preoperative assessment, as well as postoperative surveillance. With that said, I will now turn the webinar over to today's speaker, Ms. Kelly Burns. Kelly? Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to take a moment to thank the IAC for hosting this webinar and giving me the opportunity to speak on really what is one of my favorite topics. So I appreciate your time and attention, and I hope you find this program informative. By way of disclosures, uh, I am currently on the Executive Committee for the Society for Vascular Ultrasound, um, and I hold the position of treasurer. The opinions expressed in this webinar are not necessarily the opinion of the IAC or the SVU. With that said, I do want to remind you that compliance with current IAC standards is required. If you have questions regarding the standards, please refer those to the IAC. Our learning objectives for today are as follows. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe the mechanical and biological processes related to maturation. You should be able to discuss the duplex criteria for sonographic maturity. And finally, list the steps for obtaining a flow volume. As part of this lecture, I will give you a protocol for duplex imaging of dialysis access that can be used in developing your own institution-specific IAC compliant protocol. In addition to the learning objectives, I will help you understand the new IAC standard that is relevant to dialysis access that was part of the July revision, which comes, becomes effective on January 1, 2017. And I suspect that's why many of you have tuned into this webinar because of this recent change. So, um, and just to refer to that standard, that's the IAC standard 3.9.4.4b, which states that blood flow volumes must be documented from at least one site when looking at AVF or dialysis access graphs. We'd like to take a moment here just to um, kind of poll our audience. Um, so we have a couple polling questions here. So this, um, this is my first time doing a polling question, so this is going to be kind of interesting to see how this goes. But the first question we have here is what kind of testing do you perform? Is it primarily vascular, primarily echo? Both vascular and echo are performed regularly by you. 
So if you could answer that question, I'm going to give you a little time to, to do that. And while you're doing that, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about kind of how I got started into vascular. And I actually um, took the echo pathway, um, and that's how I got into vascular. I um, started out as an EKG tech and then uh, began to do echo. I did adult echo, then did pediatric echo. Um, and then after doing that for a couple years, then I took up vascular, kind of how I got started. There we go. We're starting to get some results in here. All right. So I'm seeing here that on this call today, we primarily have most people here um, do vascular, about 71% of you all. So that's good. We've got a few echo people in here and some that do um, both vascular and echo regularly. So that's great. That helps us kind of know who's tuning in. Now, our next question, this is one um, that, that I'm really interested in, is what is your comfort level with scanning dialysis access? Okay. What I want to know um, is, is it something that um, it's like, oh, I hate it. I don't want to do it. Please don't ask me to do it. Um, do you just absolutely hate it? Or do you don't mind doing it, you know, but you could use more tips on it? Um, or are you very comfortable with it, uh, but maybe you'd like to know a little bit about what everybody else is doing? Or are you kind of like me? You love them. Please call me in. I don't mind getting called in to do one. That's kind of what I would like to know. So let's see here. So we're starting to get them in. Uh, we got a few out there, a few haters, 15%. Um, don't mind them, 38%, confident, and love to see it. About 17% just absolutely love them. So hopefully at least um, maybe we can move some people out of the hate them category to the don't mind them. At least you feel maybe a little more confident about trying them at the end of this lecture. That's really what I would like to see um, in the end. So. Let's move on here to some of the content we have. So what is the goal um, that we want to see? What is the patient outcome that we would like, like to achieve? And that is we want our patient to be able to, to have hemodialysis three times a week. They need to be able to run at rates of 350 to 500 milliliters per minute. And then we're also concerned with the ease of cannulation. We want to make sure that the, the conduit is of adequate diameter so that the, it'll accept the needles. We also need to make sure that it's at an adequate depth. We want it to be shallow enough so that we don't cause trauma when they're cannulating that access, right? Um, we also um, want to make sure it's in a position that's comfortable for the patient to be able to sit through hours of dialysis, but also that sometimes we have to superficialize it or transpose it to move it away um, for, from where nerves or that might be to an area that would be easier for access. We also need to make sure that there's adequate length. We need to have 10 centimeters or at least two four centimeter segments um, that can accommodate two needles with the tips far enough apart to prevent recirculation. So what are our options for hemodialysis? Well, generally speaking, there are three. First is a fistula, and I'm sure everybody's heard of fistula first and our desire um, to try to place fistulas in people before grafts. Um, so why would we want to do a fistula first? One of the main reasons is the lower incidence of death and access-related complications. They also have higher primary and secondary patency rates. One of the disadvantages, though, is fistulas need time to mature, and some of them never mature. So, you know, we can have high failure rates with fistulas. Grass, on the other hand, they can be used much sooner after they're placed. That is one of their advantages. The problem is, is they tend to have higher restenosis rates. Those usually occur at the venous anastomosis. They have higher thrombosis rates, higher infection rates, and there's a greater potential for steel. Grass, however, can be ideal for certain patient populations, um, patients that are diabetic, um, obese, some of the elderly. Some of those, a graft is actually um, might be a better, um, better suited for them. But rather we choose a fistula or graft, what we're trying to avoid is putting a catheter in. Catheters are related with um, a lot more infections, and they cause prob problems with central vein stenosis. So at all costs, we really want to try um, to put a catheter, uh, to avoid putting catheters in. If a catheter is placed, we want to do everything we can to get that person off of that and using an alternate um, access site as soon as possible. So that leads us to hurdles to maturation. And this is really, it's a, a really well illustrated point that uh, Dr. Michael Allen had included in a paper, uh, and I borrowed for this slide. And it's the hurdles to maturation. 
So we look here, the first hurdle is early referral. Um, and that's where the nephrologist needs to refer a patient early to a surgeon for placement of a fistula. All right, and then we go through the, the preoperative mapping and trying to get that patient in for fistula placement. That's that second hurdle. But the biggest hurdle is the fistula maturation. Um, that is the one that is the hardest to get over um, and requires the cooperation and team approach of both the sonographer and the surgeon. If we successfully jump that hurdle, then the next one would be the fistula cannulation, and then the pot of gold at the end would be your mature fistula. Let's take a few moments to discuss the physiology of maturation. So what happens when an AVF is actually created? Why do some fistulas mature, whereas others do not? To answer this question, it is important to understand the changes that occur after the creation of an arterial venous anastomosis. So, but an in-depth discussion is beyond the scope of this lecture, right? Um, in fact, this is something that is the, the subject of much research. Um, but for our discussion, we're gonna look just at a couple points. I wanna look at what happens at a mechanical level and at a biological level after AVF creation. So one of the most important predictors of successful AVF development is the ability of the arteries and veins to dilate under the influence of increased shear stress, which results in vessel remodeling. Before an AVF is created, how is arterial flow regulated? It's regulated by the arterioles, right? At rest, the arterial flow demonstrates high resistance. When you exercise, or in the case of reactive hyperemia, what happens? that moves to more of a low resistance. As the oxygen demand increases, the arterioles open up. And because of that, flow wants to go from a high pressure to a lower pressure. So then flow would move towards the hand. Well, when we create a, a fistula, when we make that arterial venous anastomosis, what happens is the venous system is now your very low flow system. So the blood wants to bypass the resistance vessels in the distal extremity, and instead it goes into the venous side. So what happens when that happens is there's an increase in blood flow. The blood flow causes an increase in shear stress. And from there, the vessel dilates to try to maintain the original level of shear stress. That is, it increases the radius to try to decrease the resistance applied to the wall. This is explained by Poise's law. Um, and basically, just simply, it's the amount of flow is dependent on the pressure differential, the radius of the vessel, the length of the vessel, and the viscosity of the blood. What I want you to take away from this slide is the radius is the most important factor. So let's look here. If all the other factors stayed the same and the radius doubled, you would see on the bottom left hand um, of the screen there of this slide, you're, you would get a 16-fold increase in the milliliters per minute going through that tube. Then if you doubled it again and your radius is now four, again, another 16-fold increase and you're up to 256 milliliters per minute. We do need to realize there um, are some assumptions that may not apply to um, the vascular system. This assumes a rigid pipe that's not elastic. Um, we know when we get to the venous side, side of things, right, it's going to be more elastic. This assumes a straight pipe with no curves, a constant viscosity, a constant length, and also a constant flow rate. And it assumes it's non-pulsatile, which we know in the system that we'll have, um, we will have some pulsatility. But generally speaking, this helps to explain the flow of blood. Fistulas that are unlikely to mature and require immediate revision or abandonment can be identified as soon as um, right after creation, intraoperatively. And this table here is, um, just compares the cutoff values for four different studies that use transit time ultrasonography for intraoperative flow volumes. So you can see these here, the different um, cutoff values depending on the study. Um, and in this picture as well is an example of what a um, vascular flow probe would look like um, if it were used inside the OR suite. So it's not gonna look like our traditional probe, but what you have is um, you have a reflector plate that kind of goes underneath the vessel, and then you would have a signal going from, um, from a downstream, 
uh, signal and then an upstream signal, and it would measure the time between those two, and you could calculate the flow volume um, when you know the transit time between those two, um, two values. So that's one way they can do that. So we know as early as then we can see where uh, flow volumes change. I wanted to point this out, just uh, take a little uh, look at one of these studies here. This was a study that came out of Korea, um, and it was 50 radiocephalic fistulas that were constructed in 41 patients. The patients were followed until fistula failure or three months after the onset of hemodialysis with the fistulas. So what I want you to notice here is prior to surgery, um, the um, average of the radial um, flow volume was 21. But look, just 10 minutes after completion, it was up to 174 milliliters per minute. And perhaps even more impressively, look at how it changed from just 10 minutes after completion of the, the anastomosis to one day. We already moved up to 754 milliliters per minute. So it kind of makes you wonder, could we start looking at fistulas as soon as you know, a day after creation, can we use our conventional duplex ultrasound to kind of predict which ones um, are going to mature? Um, so, and I think the answer is yes. Um, you see, I'm just following this out to the 42 days up to 946 milliliters per minute. Now, I didn't learn about fistulas all by myself. Um, I have had a lot of help along the way. Um, so I wanted to recognize a couple people here. Um, this is Tish Poe, and uh, if you don't recognize her, um, past president of SVU, and Steve Talbot here. So Steve actually did a lecture for SVU, one of our pre-conference sessions, and um, I asked him if I could borrow this because Steve had a great uh, way of explaining um, flow and, and how vessels take on more flow and what happens with remodeling. Um, so I wanted to share it with you. Steve said it was, it was fine if I, I used it. And so I think this is very helpful. Um, this is, I want you to just kind of imagine each of these cars kind of as um, blood cells in there. And uh, conveniently, there's cars coming towards us and cars going away. So you can imagine those are arteries and veins. And I want you to picture this as uh, what would be considered moderate amount of flow. Now, this is what would be um, if it was asked to take on extra flow, extra flow volume, right? We've got more cars in there coming and going. But after a while, you're not going to put up with all that traffic, right? What happens? What we want to do is remodeling, right? We would add more lanes to the, to the highway or to the road, okay? So just vision that. But does remodeling always go the way we want it? No. Sometimes there's negative remodeling, such as lane closures or a stenosis or a narrowing, right, in that first example. Sometimes you find unexpected things in the roadway, right? So um, think of when you're looking at fistulas or think about veins. Sometimes we have valves that get in the way um, that could cause an obstruction. Other times there's detours. So think of that as your, your branch veins, um, that sometimes we see, and then sometimes you just get this jam, right, and there's just an occlusion. Um, so those are examples of negative remodeling. That's not really what we want. Instead, what we want to see is this positive remodeling, and if everything goes according to plan, it'll look something more like this, right? We have more lanes added, so maybe instead of three lanes, we're now up to six, so we can handle that increased traffic. So that's just one way to think about mechanical um, ways of remodeling, right? We increase the flow and we want to increase the, the radius or the, the diameter going across there, right? So one last thing I wanted to touch on related to this is uh, the biological level. What happens at a biological level? Well, this is what happens. Arterial endothelial cells sense the sudden increase in arterial flow, which occurs just after the access creation. So the endothelium responds by aligning cells in the direction of flow and in increasing the availability of nitric oxide and prostacycline, which promotes vasodilation, it inhibits thrombosis, and platelet aggregation. Well, at least this is what's supposed to happen if you have normal endothelial layer. But unfortunately, in our patients with end-stage renal disease, oftentimes we see that there's dysfunction of the endothelium. So some things that we can see that you may pick up are calcified arteries. Do we think that calcified arteries are going to respond the same way? No, probably not. 
These patients um, often are diabetic. Um, and then uh, in the setting of uremia, oftentimes this nitric oxide is not released. So you don't get that um, flow-mediated dilation that we would like to see at a cellular level. So just keep that in mind. I think that's also important when we're considering our preoperative um, assessment of patients, why it's so important um, to maybe check the arteries and veins to see how they're going to dilate um, to simulate that increase in nitric oxide. So just keep that in mind when um, going through here. And that, that's kind of why I wanted to go through the importance of maturation in the process of it. So now we're going to move to sonographic maturity. And this is um, where we come into play particularly. I want you to understand what is involved in maturation and what our role is in determining that. Maturation is still um, pretty much determined by clinical assessment, right? We can, um, when the physician sees the patient back in the office, um, they can tell on physical exam generally, um, is that, does it have a thrill, does it have a brewy, you know, it, does it seem mature? Um, but we still have a role as well. The, the Kidney Disease Outcome Quality Initiative guidelines recommend monthly surveillance of blood flow rates. Some of the ways of doing that, um, this would be after a patient is on dialysis, would be through um, saline ultrasound dilution and these different dilution techniques. But one thing to remember, the only, thing, the only technique that can be done outside of a hemodialysis session would be duplex ultrasound. Um, so we have a role because these these patients, um, we need to determine, get a baseline for them, get a baseline flow volume. Uh, we also need to determine if they have problems intraoperatively uh, or maybe at their first follow-up appointment. These patients should be the ones that we're seeing and should be sent for duplex ultrasound so that we can determine maturation before they're cannulated. So what criteria should be used? Well, in our lab, this is the criteria we use for duplex um, uh, for our duplex exam to determine sonographic maturity. Is the diameter greater than 0.4 centimeters? Is the depth less than 0.5 centimeters? And is the volume flow greater than or equal to 500 milliliters per minute? Now, some of you all may have heard of other um, criteria, and one of the more popular ones is the rule of sixes. Um, that would be that the diameter is greater than 0.6, the depth is less than 0.6, and the flow volume is greater than 600. So there are other criteria out there, but I'll share with you why we use this one. We base our criteria on a paper that came out of um, uh, UAB. This was um, Michelle Robin and her group there looked at fistula adequacy. They found that when the venous diameter is greater than 0.4 centimeters, there's an 89% adequacy rate versus 44%. When the flow volume is greater than or equal to 500 milliliters per minute, the adequacy rate was 84% compared to 43%. When both criteria were met, there was a 95% adequacy, but when neither criteria were met, 33% adequacy. One of the things that we didn't find in, um, in this paper, though, um, and maybe some of the questions you all have as well, is where do you take the flow volume? Um, so we looked um, at some of the published guidelines to try to figure out where we should do that. And one of the things we came across was looking at it on the venous side. So they recommended looking in the mid portion of the draining vein in an area that was straight, non-tapering, and non-turbulent. And they recommended averaging three to five measurements. Well, I don't know about you all, but... If you've um, looked at dialysis access, this is more what you see in the outflow or the efferent vein. It's prone to tortuosity. There's often variations in the vessel diameter. And then you have problems with um, bifurcations or those um, vessels, branch vessels that can take off. Looking in comparison, the efferent vein is very thin walled. It's easily compressed. It's subject to vibrations. The diameters can be inaccurate. And it's often difficult to get a good tracing uh, for the timed average mean velocity that you need in your calculation for your flow volume. In comparison, the afferent artery has a nice straight course. It has constant diameters, rigid walls, and low incidence of stenosis. So with that, the knowledge that we had, in our lab, we set out to test a hypothesis, and we wanted to actually look to try to figure out which was more accurate accurate, looking at the afferent artery or the efferent vein. 
So we actually undertook a study, um, and the purpose of the study was to compare flow volumes in the afferent artery and the efferent vein to known clinical outcomes in patients with autogenous upper arm arterial venous fistula to determine which was more accurate in predicting fistula maturation. So what we did is um, the same sonographer, which was me, um, performed these studies. We used a Phillips IU-22, which with, we used an L9-3 transducer. We studied patients at a co constant temperature, um, and then we also compared flow volumes relative to the anastomosis, two centimeter cephalid in the afferent artery, two centimeter cephalid in the efferent vein. We used a standardized method, and we looked at these patients four to six weeks post-creation, but before cannulation. In this study, if you're interested in it more, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the results of it, but we have included our manuscript um, that you can download as a resource as well. So if you want to read more about what we did for this study. This tells you a little bit about the, the patients that we saw. Um, the ultrasound evaluation results were retrospectively analyzed in 72 patients with upper arm autogenous arterial venous fistulas. The adequacy of maturation was known in 61 of these patients thereby establishing our sample size. Of the 61 patients, 50 had brachiocephalic configurations and 11 were brachiobacillic transpositions. One major difference in the two types of the upper arm AVS was the lack of venous branching in the brachiobacillic transpositions. And since venous branching was a potential source of error in using the efferent vein for flow volume calculations, we performed separate analyses on this subset of patients. So I'm not going to go into too much um, detail here. I just want you all to see that for the afferent artery blood flow rate, um, 900 milliliters or greater was associated with an adequate fistula in 30 of the 33 um, cases. Um, so here we had a, um, a positive predictive value of 91%. As compared to the efferent vein, where our positive predictive value at 800 milliliters was only 75%. So for our lab, we, um, when we did the, um, the receiver operating curves, um, we decided that um, 900 here um, was a good cutoff in the afferent artery flow volumes. And so that's what we tend to use in our lab now. So based on that, we also looked in the literature to see what other cutoff values were. And so these are two of the studies we, um, we found. One was um, Dr. Back uh, and Bandic. The study came out in 2008. They also used a flow volume of less than 800 milliliters per minute to predict the need for remedial intervention. Um, and then BASO also, um, this came out a little bit um, earlier, 1999, flow volume of 900 milliliters per minute for fistulas and 1,300 milliliters for, for grass, um, provided an 81% and 79% sensitivity, 79% and 67% specificity. So in that case as well, a functional disorder or a morphologic complication was associated with all fistulas and grafts in which flow rates were lower than 500 milliliters per minute or 800 milliliters per minute in the graph. And we kind of find, um, find that as well. Another question I get is, what about radiocephalics? Um, if you're looking at a radiocephalic artery, where, um, where should you be taking your flow volumes? And so um, for us, we still use the brachial artery um, rather, than, rather than the radial artery. Um, and in reviewing the literature, this seems to be, um, be the standard. Uh, Bandic, as recently as um, 2015, um, showed great success in using uh, flow, flow volume measurements, uh, finding that they correlated with the flow volume in the access. And he also used a cutoff of 800 milliliters per minute to predict the successful hemodialysis if other anatomic criteria were met. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of those there, but they are there for you if you want to pull those studies um, and look at those. But what I do want to spend some time on is calculating flow volume. There are two key components, the timed average mean velocity and the diameter. And the assumption here is that it's a circle. And remember, um, the area of the circle is pi times that radius squared. So it's going to be very important um, when you're taking your diameter that you're very accurate. Um, and then there's just the equation we use in calculating uh, volume flow. You don't really need to know it because um, if you're using a um, scanner, 
uh, a modern scanner, then those are all going to have flow volume uh, calculation packages on them. So um, you can consult with your application specialist if you have trouble or need, need help uh, figuring out where those are. So some of the tips for calculating volume flow, you want to make sure you have a 60-degree angle. You want a sample volume slightly larger than your vessel size. You're going to measure for two to three cardiac cycles. You're going to measure the diameter and grayscale. I recommend that. If you have color on, it's oftentimes uh, hard to see the vessel wall. You might want to use zoom to visualize the vessel walls better. And you want to make sure you're not compressing the vessel. The criteria we use for interpretation in our lab is if the flow volume is between 500 and 900 milliliters per minute, it indicates a functional disorder and a fistulogram is warranted. Now, if there's uh, flow volumes below 500 milliliters per minute, that indicates impending failure of the AVF or the AV graft, as the case may be, and the poor, there's usually poor outcomes related to that. So once the flow volumes get that low, uh, generally, even if you have to do a revision or um, you know a thrombectomy or something like that, the outcomes generally um, you're, you might be able to buy a little bit of time, um, but you may uh, need to start looking for another place to to place an access. Um, and again, um, if the flow volumes are high, that can be a problem as well. That can indicate high cardiac output failure, and we'll discuss a little bit of that at the end of this lecture. Some of the other things we uh, would like to investigate further related to flow volumes, um, we have noticed that the afferent artery flow volumes are greater than the efferent vein flow volumes by more than 30%. That can indicate uh, anastomosis stenosis. As far as the efferent vein, if they're greater than the afferent artery by more than 30%, that could indicate a significant steal. And if you see diminishing flow volumes, um, along the efferent vein from the anastomosis going up to the shoulder, that can indicate central vein stenosis. So again, those just need more investigating, but just some of the observations we've had. I want to discuss just a, uh, briefly about velocity and flow volumes. They're, they are two entirely different things, and you need both of them in your criteria. Um, velocity looks at the relationship um, uh, of distance over a unit of time, where flow volume looks at volume over a unit of time. The normal findings in an AVF uh, for a fistula or a graft, you would want to see peak systolic velocities of 150 to 400 centimeters per second, and the end diastolic velocity should be between 60 and 250, much higher uh, than what we would see in a normal artery or that, right? Um, you would see marked spectral broadening throughout the fistula and the graft. You would expect to see low resistance waveform in the afferent artery, increased velocities and pulsatility noted in the efferent vein, and the flow volumes are going to increase with vessel diameter. Let's just look at a couple examples here of how velocity and flow volume um, work differently. So here there are acceptable velocities, right, 172 over 88. But look at the flow volumes. These are really low. This is in the brachial artery, and the, the flow volumes are only 386 um, milliliters per minute. The problem here uh, ended up being something in the outflow vein. Um, but you can't always just look at the velocities and uh, assume everything's okay. And that's why uh, use of flow volumes is so very important. In this example, we'll see that the velocities are actually, they're marginal. The peak systolic velocities are a little low at 131, but the flow volumes look, um, look good at um, almost 1,300 milliliters per minute. In this next case, the velocities are normal and there's a high flow volume. If you'll notice here, the diameter is 1.15 centimeters. Um, so as the radius increases, we see an increase in flow, right? Look at the flow volumes here. 4,900 milliliters per minute. So the radius got larger and the flow volumes got larger. Here's the case, though, I want to show you. If you see the, the diameter here is 1.5 in this, but look here. We have a loss of pulsatility, okay? And look at the, um, the velocities. Um, in the second picture, that's where we actually just measured the velocities, and the velocities are very low. Um, but the flow volumes on the picture on the left, they look adequate, right? Flow volumes are 1,300. Um, so if you just looked at flow volumes alone in this patient, um, you would think that everything's okay. Uh, but 
they weren't in this patient. This was actually a pediatric patient who had a, a very um, mature fistula. He'd had it for several years, um, but he had a stenosis up by the clavicle because there was so much dilatation um, that the clavicle was compressing the subclavian artery. And this patient actually, before um, any intervention could be done, actually uh, clotted off his, his access because the flow was just, um, the velocities were way too low um, to uh, keep it from clotting. So... Those are how those two work together. So now we're going to focus the rest of our time on performing the examination. So this is a this is an important part, and I hope uh, you can um, use this. Um, the first thing I want to tell you about is the room setup. Very important. Uh, your duplex imager, you probably all have high-frequency transducers, your hockey stick probes. Um, these, are, these are very important. I'll show you some examples um, in a moment. Uh, but those are good for using um, to image the superficial structures. But they're not very good for um, getting your, your Doppler waveforms. You need lower-frequency Doppler for evaluation because there's going to be really high velocities encountered in these. Um, you're also going to need to adjust your color Doppler settings uh, for high-velocity flow profiles. The other thing I'd like to recommend is you get a bedside table. Please, 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 don't try doing these um, with the arm in your lap. It's, it's not comfortable for you. It's not comfortable for your patient, and you can save yourself that embarrassing um, wet lap when you get done. Uh, some of the other things you might want to have handy are a tape measure um, and a marker, because sometimes you might want the marker to mark a stenosis. And remember, we need to have adequate length in order to cannulate. So sometimes it's helpful to have a tape measure. A tape measure will also help you, um, when you're writing up your study, kind of figure out you could use um, the scars as um, a landmark and basically say you know how far from the arterial anastomosis was a stenosis. So those are things that are nice to have in your little toolbox there and um, have in the room when you're doing a patient. So, so what is the protocol for um, AVF maturation for, for an exam? Again, remember, these are just guidelines. Make sure you're um, following the IAC standards and um, tailor this to your own institution. But for us, we like to review the operative notes, do a brief physical exam. We're going to be looking for a thrill or a brewery, an aneurysm, a water ha a hammer pulse. That might indicate a stenosis. We're going to look for prominent branches and look for scars. The scars will often help you, um, if you've reviewed the operative notes, your scars should match what you found in the operative notes. The next thing you want to do, I recommend if you're doing a maturation study, the majority of problems are going to be found in the outflow vein. So that's where I like to start. So we're going to look in the um, efferent vein. We're going to measure the diameters from the inner wall to the inner wall. And we're going to look at the depth, the skin line to the top of the vessel. Now, one thing I want to caution you here, you need to have a discussion with your, your surgeon or whoever's going to be reading your vascular studies because you want to make sure you're discussing, you're talking the same language, if you will. Um, so what I mean here is you want to get your distal and your proximal straight. Some people, um, once a fistula is created, will consider the, the proximal to be closest to the anastomosis uh, and distal would be closer to the shoulder. But that kind of goes against everything we know as, as sonographers, right? Um, generally, um, it would be the reverse. So you need to have that discussion so that when you're saying there's a proximal uh, stenosis, then they know is that near the shoulder or is that near the um, uh, anecubital fossa or, or closer to the anastomosis. So you also want to note when you're doing your study um, any areas of narrowing. And you also want to note any branches and note their location in relation to the arterial anastomosis. It's also important to note any extrinsic findings such as seromas or hematomas. The next thing you're going to want to do is obtain your flow volume in the efferent vein using your system software. Okay? Um, evaluate with color Doppler. You're going to optimize your settings for high flow. You're going to obtain a spectral Doppler at areas of increased turbulence and narrowing if appropriate. Um, and this, this is a good example here. Um, this is where a valve site was, uh, and there was a high-grade stenosis there. And you can see, look, flow should be um, blue um, moving back towards the heart because um, this is in the efferent vein. But the, the pressure here is such that the flow actually started moving back down towards the hand um, because the, the blockage was so great. The next thing is to look at the arterial anastomosis. 
Um, this is the juxtanastomotic region, that region just cranial um, to the anastomosis in the efferent vein and then again uh, on the arterial side. You're going to obtain your spectral Doppler through here. You're going to note any audible brewery. Uh, remember your flow volumes, are or not your flow volumes, but your velocities are typically going to be very high in here. Don't let that throw you. Um, your flow volumes are, are what are important. Um, velocities are going to be high. Um, it's just the nature of the beast through here. Um, but the other thing I want you to know is you need to evaluate this with B-mode imaging. Um, this is where your hockey stick probe is very, uh, very valuable to you. If you do see um, the high velocities and also get that audible brewery, take your color off and switch to that hockey stick probe and try to look for um, examples such as this where you may actually have, um, have some uh, neoenzymal hyperplasia or something going on at the anastomosis that would be important. The next thing would be to look at the inflow or the afferent artery. You're going to want to do this at least two centimeters cranial to the arterial anastomosis. Uh, again, use your system software to calculate that. But if your flow volumes are low and you have no other cause, like you didn't see anything in the outflow vein that was a problem, make sure to verify your surgical configuration and look further upstream. Was there a problem with the axillary or the subclavian arteries? Um, you're also going to want to use your B-mode imaging to look for a stenosis. Another thing that's really important, um, particularly if the efferent vein flow volumes are low, you're going to want to check your venous outflow. Um, this is going to be your cephalic arch. This is particularly important in brachial cephalic uh, configurations. And you're going to want to check the swing point for your basilic vein transpositions. You're going to want to follow this all the way up into the subclavian vein. And this is an example here. You can see a uh, narrowing um, there's also patients, there are some cases out there where the arch is truncated and you may not have um, a true arch, there just may be a lot of collaterals there. So these would be important to document as well. All right, I'm just going to tell you just a little bit here. Um, protocol if uh, you need to look at the outflow artery, if the patient complains of hand pain or coolness, you're going to want to verify that the flow is towards the hand. But if the flow is, ret is retrograde, you can compress the fistula and monitor for normalization of flow. And then you could also obtain an order for a physiologic test if it were indicated. So here is um, just an example of using duplex to do that and then using uh, PPG. And here you see um, the digit brachial index was 0.33 without compression of the fistula. With AVF compression, it went up to 0.65. So that would be indicative of a hemodynamically significant steal being caused by the AVF. I've included a slide here. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, this is just an overview of factors leading to access dysfunction. I did want to point out, because we haven't talked about graphs a lot, um, but the venous anastomosis is a site um, because there's a mismatch in elastic wall properties where you're going to get a lot of problems um, with a stenosis. So know if you've got a graft and the flow volumes are low, look at the venous anastomosis. That's going to be your typical um, culprit there. Also, no um, valve sites. Radiocephalics are known um, to have a valve that can cause problems um, in that juxta anastomotic uh, position. So just think about it this way. If valves aren't removed and they're left in there, as the vein uh, dilates, those valve cusps are going to get stretched and get fibrotic. And so sometimes they need to go in with a balloon and kind of pop those valves um, open. So um, be, be weary of those as well. The significance of accessory veins, um, they're more worrisome if they're close to the arterial anastomosis. If you see them near the shoulder, kind of as in this patient, you're going to want to look for central vein stenosis. Just going to show you a couple pictures here before we move on to some questions. Um, this is just a mega fistula. If, if uh, no one's seen those, they tend to be really big and ropey looking. Um, you're going to expect flow volumes to be really high in these. Same with aneurysms. Uh, sometimes you'll see aneurysms that have been treated. If they're redundant, um, kind of like the, the tortuous one there at the bottom, you can put an interposition graft in those. So sometimes you'll encounter those. So um, just some examples there. And just a slide here on uh, high cardiac output failure. Um, I just want you to be aware um, high flow volumes aren't always good. Um, so these patients can tend to, to have problems with cardiac failure. So these are some of the signs you'll want to look for. 
So I've put that in. That's really kind of a, an advanced kind of level thing, but, uh, but you have that there if you need to refer to it. So in conclusion, um, there are many ways of using flow volumes. Um, you could use them intraoperatively. Um, perhaps what's most important to us is our ability to, de to help determine adequate maturation and to be able to assess functional disorders um, so that we know which patients need to go on to have fistulograms done. We can also use flow volumes to help guide interventions. So if we uh, took a flow volume um, before um, an angioplasty or a venoplasty, um, what were they afterwards? So was that intervention successful? So these are all ways we can use this and all ways we can try to improve um, patient outcomes uh, through, through the use of our testing. So this is uh, my contact information. I welcome, we'll hopefully get to some questions today. I can answer some of them, but feel free to um, reach out to me. I'm always interested in hearing um, other case studies. Um, and so if you have images you want to share with me, contact me offline and we'll go, um, go through those um, together. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. At this time, we'll begin the Q&A session. From IAC Vascular Testing and Vein Center, I'd like to introduce Marge Hutchison, IAC Director of Accreditation, who will assist with the Q&A session today. Marge, would you like to start us off? I sure would. Thank you. And Kelly, thank you. Um, what, a, what a beautiful uh, talk. Uh, so much information, uh, you'll probably be getting a lot of emails from people. Um, I guess um, I've picked out a couple questions. There's a lot of them, and maybe we can address some of them. And I just want to let everybody know that uh, if we don't get to your uh, question live, uh, we will get to you through email. Every question will be answered. Um, first of all, Kelly, when a, when a new patient comes in for, to you for a possible uh, fistula or graft or something like that, what is your primary, uh, shall we say, mapping uh, procedure? How do you start it? Where do you go? What vessels are you looking at? That sort of thing. Uh, for a mapping? Um, yes. So, yeah. So we look at the arterial inflow, um, looking for calcification. Um, sometimes if there is calcification present, we will um, do reactive hyperemia to see how the vessel changes. Um, so we'll do that. Um, we look at the outflow vein. Of course, the um, uh, quality of it is we find actually more important than, than just the diameter size. So is there any wall thickening? Um, you know, we're looking at that if they've had a lot of sticks in the past. Um, we definitely want to check the outflow. A lot of people stop at the shoulder, um, but if you're looking at the cephalic, you want to make sure to follow it all the way um, in uh, to make sure there's not that truncated arch. You want to uh, make sure you have good quality there. Um, you're going to check to make sure, um, is there good respiratory variation in your subclavian? Um, that'll help you predict if there's a central vein stenosis. Um, I think that's the, the main highlights. I, I have, um, if anybody's interested, I have separate criteria for, um, for preoperative mapping that I don't, uh, we can hang on there as well if anybody's interested. Um, okay. So. Um, the next question is, uh, you frequently mentioned efferent vein and afferent artery. Can you just explain those terms a little bit? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, an afferent artery is what's coming into the fistula that's carrying the blood flow in. So an efferent artery related to that would be everything below the anastomosis. So afferent is coming, coming into that. Um, the efferent vein is um, the section of the vein after the anastomosis, so the flow there um, that would be traveling back up through the subclavian into the heart. That's the efferent vein. Okay. Yeah. You also mentioned water hammer pulse. What does that mean? Um, well, you'll actually, it, that's something you can, um, you'll, you can see visually on a patient. If you can see that thumping, kind of like a, if you imagine a jackhammer or a water hammer, um, you'll be able to see that. And it's very indicative of uh, a stenosis. Um, and you'll just see the pulsations um, in, in that. So it's a very okay. distinct thing. All right. When you talked about evaluating for um, steel to the hand, you talked about uh, compressing the fistula. Do you really recommend that sonographers compress the fistula? Um, yes, with one caveat. Don't do it right after a fistulogram or you will get a squirter. So um, you're going to do this. Um, it's generally under the, the order or direction of of the, um, the surgeon who placed it will generally ask you uh, to do that. A patient will get sent to you for that. 
Uh, but again, if they just left um, the the um, hybrid suite or that, if if they just had a fistulogram done, uh, you don't want to do that. I would ask your surgeon to be present and and compress it. But yes, we've had no no issues with that. You can briefly um, stop flow going through the fistula, and it will not cause a problem. So yes, that's good to know. Yes. Um, what oh, this next question? What do you mean when you talk about a cephalic arch? Okay, so it's that that portion um, of the cephalic up near the clavicle before it dumps into the subclavian. Um, it's it's that area in there. It's the angle where the um, cephalic dumps in into there. It's that segment. Okay, what are your thoughts about flow uh, of the fistula greater than two hundred mLs per minute? Uh, if it's if it's only I'm, greater, I'm sorry, two thousand. Two thousand. Sorry, two thousand. You're starting 2000. to get up there. We typically, um, I would not be too concerned, but that's something where you just want to monitor the patient at two thousand. Um, if they're not having any signs of um, heart failure, um, then you're probably fine. Um, but generally, what we see is over twenty five hundred. Um, cubic centimeters or milliliters per minute um, is when patients start to show um, some, some signs of heart failure. All right. Um, is there really any comparison in terms of velocity and flow volumes? Does anything go hand in hand there? Um, that's still something we're still looking at, and we still see them kind of as being independent um, at this point. So, more research to come on that, but um, I would look at those variables as, as not necessarily being um, related to each other. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, the radiocephalic AVF, you calculate the flow volume of the brachial artery. Is that correct? That and is correct. And if so, why not the radial artery? Okay, because the... Um, uh, there's several reasons. One of the, the brachial artery um, has been demonstrated um, to be very predictive of what's going on distally. A lot of what we do, right, um, is um, taking something more proximal and it's indicative of what's going on distally. Uh, the brachial artery, below that you have the ulnar artery and the radial. So um, you're going to split some of your flow volume. Some of it's going to go, most of it will go into the, to the radiocephalic, but some's going to come through the ulnar and come back around. Um, some of it's just ease. When you get down to some of these radial arteries, they're so small, um, it's hard to get an accurate um, inner wall to inner wall. Um, so it's easier sometimes to do brachial. And we really don't want to have multiple sets of criteria. We know if you take it in the radial artery itself, just due to the diameter, um, that the flow volume is going to be slightly lower. Uh, but just for consistency and being able to compare things, the studies are out there that have been done that show that the brachial artery is just as comparable um, to use it. Um, so that a lot of it is just um, ease and being able to compare apples to apples that, that we do it. All right. And what happens when you have a high bifurcation brachial artery? Where do you sample then? Ah, well, you're still going to do it in what is your inflow artery, but I will tell you, um, that is an, another point back to the preoperative mapping. The mm -hmm. high brachial artery bifurcation is, um, can be a really big problem in creating access. So I think because the, the vessels don't uh, adapt properly because they don't get the amount of flow going through them that they need to when you have the high brachial artery bifurcation, so that's something important to note. Um, in your preoperative mapping, but you're going to still take it in whatever your um, whatever it, your inflow artery is. Um, so whether it's your high radial or your true brachial, whatever it is, um, your whatever's connected to the anastomosis, follow from your anastomosis on up. Um, but I, I would be interested in knowing what other people are finding. Typically, if um, you have a patient with high brachial artery bifurcation, you're going to get low flow volumes. So. Okay. Um, this, uh, I think this will probably be our last question, but um, when you're doing a duplex ultrasound of a graft or a AVF or whatever you're doing, um, and you see an obvious uh, high-velocity uh, stenotic-type area like at the most anastomosis site, what are your velocity criteria for that specific area? There's not really specific um, criteria. A lot of people um, say if... You know, if you want to compare those velocities to what is in the brachial artery or what's proximal to it, 
um, they shouldn't be more than 3.5 times higher. So you'll, you might see that ratio. We haven't had much luck with that. I, instead of using velocity criteria, that's where you would use your flow volumes on either side of the arterial anastomosis. If they drop significantly and you've lost a lot of energy across your arterial anastomosis, so your flow volumes uh, on the brachial artery side, you know, say they're, you know, 1,000 and then they drop and they're, you know, only 700 on the other side, um, then you're probably looking at a, a hemodynamically significant arterial anastomosis stenosis. Um, at that point. Um, so that's what I would use. Use your flow volumes. You'll also see that um, you'll hear the brie, but you'll also see that audible brie, and sonographers know what I'm talking about. You'll see that at the baseline. You'll, you'll hear it, um, and then that's when you take your, your color off and use your B-mode imaging, and you should actually be able to see um, the reason for the stenosis in there. But don't use velocity criteria alone um, at the arterial anastomosis. There's just not really a true cutoff that you can use. All right, great. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions we're going to handle today. There are many more, um, and we will get to you um, uh, via email, so don't be concerned. Um, Kelly's going to come on and talk a little bit about uh, CME, I think. Okay, great. Thanks, Marge, and thanks again, everyone, for joining us. A very special thank you to our presenter, Kelly Burns. And please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive your continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC Pro Libraries website for three business days. In the upper left, you'll click on My Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Dialysis Access, maturation, and the, flow, the role of flow volumes, beneath this title you will see the link Take Evaluation. Click this link to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the new link on the My Webinars page called View Certificate. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you all for joining us today and appreciate your participation.